It's not just Amazon, it's your own e-commerce sites, but it's still, they're a great way to uh, get to the customer, but they're not the only uh, place. Adoption of new technologies. I don't think I saw a drone here today, I might be wrong, but new technologies are really important, and that's what drives customers into store. They can see them online, but they want to get into store. Retailers want products that are connected. Retailers want products and companies that have roadmaps that think about what's a sustainable roadmap and how can I become a retail partner. Best Buy, Target, Amazon, Walmart all have pro programs today around helping you go to retail faster. We'll talk a little bit about how long that path is but you, they really want companies to come quickly. And this is a, pro, a program called Best Buy at Night. And they have a single store that's just for startups, just for those pro companies to come in and be able to get their hands, get consumers' hands on products in a very early stage program. We've got a few partners that are in this program. But they're all doing it. Target in San Francisco has Open House, another way that early adopters and early product companies can get their product to market. But if you're tired already, and I don't know who out there is tired building your product, the road to retail is hard. Retailers don't make it easy. They are in it to be profitable. They are in it to make money. And so it's this group's responsibility to help companies get to retail, get there profitably, get there smart, and succeed. It's a hard market. There's lots of choices, there's lots of channels, there's lots of different ways that consumers buy product. And as you're thinking about that product, and we encourage everybody we spoke with today, think about who the consumer is. Think about where they shop. Go into retail stores, spend time in your category. Understand what are retailers talking about? What are the, what's the sales staff talking about? What you might find is that the sales staff doesn't necessarily know a lot about those products. So it's really important that you do a great job defining your product and your product roadmap. The path to retail shouldn't be a squiggly line. I think Dana probably talked about it this morning. Uh, Dana from Russia probably talked this morning about having a clear distribution path and making sure that you've got an efficient logistics system that you're taking care of customers, that you're responding to those customers, you've got systems in place to be able to do that. So it's very important to have that def defined. Also, management over confidence. You're building a great thing. You're really excited about it. You know the technology better than ever, but ask for help, especially as it comes to retail. Make sure you've got a team behind you that can help you with the questions arise around retail. There are all sorts of terms in retail that are very difficult to answer. MDF, co-op, markdowns, how does all that work? So find a partner that can help you there. Timeline. Timeline to retail, six to 18 months. So we're developing a, a product and we've got it through crowdfunding. When should we be talking to retail? When will retail start to make decisions on your product? If I miss the timeline, if I miss the cycle, and I'll use Target as an example, Target makes decisions for this fall, 2017, they made those last fall. They, need, they wanted to talk to companies in, in the tw fall of 2016 about products that are gonna be on their shelf in 2017. So you need to start thinking about that in your cycle and planning that in, and again, thinking about how is it gonna go to consumer? How's it gonna be packaged? How's it gonna play out? So this timeline is very, very important. This picture here of all of Apple's products is also talking about roadmap. Please don't design a single product. Design a product, design a company that's gonna build a roadmap of products. Retailers wanna have multiple products on shelves. You won't be able to scale, you won't be able to survive in retail with a one-hit wonder. So you need to be telling that retailer Here's the product I have today. It's gonna to be on your shelf in six months. And then three months after that product's on shelf, you need to tell them what's the next product. And you need to be preparing for that. And it's something that you all need to think about in terms of uh, the hardware roadmap. The retail operations, that's no fun. 
but Dana's good at it, and I'm, not, I'm just picking on Dana, but <laughs> re retail operations is the part that you didn't think about as you were designing your product. It's the part that is the EDI and the returns and the customer support and the markdowns and all that. But you do have to plan for that. It's where you can make money if you do this right. If you don't do it right, it's where you can also go out of business. Then marketing. I think every company we meet feels like they're really, really good at marketing. And they probably are as they've gone through the Indiegogos and the crowdfunding Kickstarters. They built their own website. They've, they're communicating with those customers. But now they're going to shift because when they first started, when they're selling an e-commerce, they're selling 90% direct to customers. When you go into retail and you go onto retail shelves, that's going to completely turn upside down. You're now going to have 90% of your product sold through retails. So you've got to figure out how you're going to market to those companies, how you're going to market to the consumers that are at those companies. And this is not for also for the faint of heart, really figuring out how you're going to communicate that that shiny box is on the shelf so when the customer goes in there and is looking for that product, they know that it's your brand. They know that it's Luxy who's in the back and that they saw that product. So marketing to those customers and having the budget and the capital to market to those is but very, very important. And where we see a lot of mistakes made is that they're really, really good at getting the marketing put together on these social media campaigns, but there is, and they are using that to get the product into the store. Now, you've got to have a budget to make sure it moves off the shelf. And that is a completely different marketing campaign than what you've set up already to just get it to a shelf opportunity, to sell and, through. And retailers expect you to do that. So a lot of our companies come in, they'll meet with the retailer, and the retailer will challenge them. How are you gonna drive customers into my store? Uh, they don't have a clear answer. So you really have to think about that, and you have to have a real plan to make it happen. Otherwise, that product does sit on the shelf. So kind of a, a, a lot up here on this slide, but this is really about kind of all the ways for marketing that you can touch your customer, and I can see it's not showing up really great, so this will be available, my apologies. But what we're trying to talk about here is really there's 22 different ways that you're getting to customer, that you're contacting customers through marketing. You're driving awareness, your customers are researching. After they've done that, then they're purchasing, and then you need to retain the customer. 22 different points that we're touching that we've identified, there's only three of those that have to do with the retailer, only three. They're doing research on a, on a retailer's website, they're buying the product at a retailer, and they also have the opportunity for in-store demonstration at a retailer. But again, in that whole consumer journey, the consumer purchase, there are so many ways that you need to be touching the customer, your customer, before and after they get to the retailer. That's a lot of, a lot on your shoulders. <laughs> it definitely is. It's not that, it's just only three points and you're thinking you're tossing it into these large retailers. They're only affecting three points. The rest are all on your shoulders. Right. We are a big proponent also of identifying partnerships. Don't try to go across the board to everybody. Pick one or two companies that you think you can really have a meaningful relationship with. Retailers appreciate that. It is kind of hard, it's, it's daunting to find the, the right merchant within an organization, and they're all, um, they're all not approachable, but most really are. There, there's clearly in retail today an understanding that startups are part of their future. Hardware startups are gonna be the next product, the next Xbox, the next PlayStation, the next Nest. They want to talk to those companies. So don't be scared to talk to them. Just realize that the time you get and the amount of feedback you get is going to be very small because they're busy. So, but reach out, just define those, who's going to be those partnerships and have a reason as to why you want to talk to them. Mostly around, can you help them grow their business? Mostly around, is there a white space in their store? Mostly around, their customer, your customer, have a crossover. In similar paths, there it is difficult to get meetings with a lot of these big retailers, unless you've really got a plan put together and it's got a good, good pitch. 
And I want you to also know, it's not just a matter of you know, jumping and getting all 2,000 Target stores. They are really allowing you to, especially like, you know, Target, our Best Buy with the Ignite program. They've got well, one store down in Southern California here. But Target will, they've got 250 innovation, innovation stores. Walmart's got 480 innovation stores. So you can actually go back down and say, you know what, inventory risk, my money, <laughs> let me just try this in 15 stores and give me the top compelling stores that may have products similar to what you're doing and get the best of best so that you've got an opportunity to see how this would go and be able to expand it. Maybe even test the price points, the retails. They are open to doing that because you're allowing uh, exciting products to come into those top stores. Don't be afraid to ask. It, it isn't as big an inventory risk and a big wave of fear that many of you have talked to us about in some of these individual meetings. Well, I don't know if I can afford to go into all the thousand stores. It's, they are opportunities to get your product into a smaller amount and kind of test with them to bring it along. They're not at, at risk either. Packaging, I, I always include this slide because I think, um, I think as, again, as you're building this product and you're really close to it and you know all the features, you've got to be able to, when you go on a retail shelf, articulate to the consumer. And it's not all about uh, the Microsoft box that we thought of years ago that's got like hundreds of features. It's pretty clear that you need to give a uh, communication and uh, around your product so consumers understand what it is. Find a packaging company. We can certainly recommend them, others can recommend them, but make sure that when you're walking into that retailer, you know how it's gonna look on the shelf. Thinking here about now, I'm in store, and again, we, we really push our, our clients, our entrepreneurs to get in store and understand around what is an assortment? Why do they have a brand striped? Why do they have a product uh, over in a different category that maybe would be in the electronics category. And I'm using Nest as an example. Uh, training is really important. How do we train? How do we get people to understand and tell the stories about our products? So planning for these, having the capital to be able to do this and, and pulling that together is, is very critical. And then a promotion strategy. Your price may be $150, but retailers, they all want to keep that $150, but they also all will promote those products. It's a part of the strategy. Father's Day, Mother's Day, back to school. Those are all key drive times when people are in stores and they want to buy products. So you need to come in with a plan. And a digital strategy. Uh, this is a company called Ubitech. They did a really good job with a digital strategy coming out. They, they were an unknown brand at the beginning of this year, uh, beginning of 16. They did a really good job with a strong PR, strong social, strong website to communicate their product and, and launch their brand. And with that, and they had this put together before they went to retail, they were able to go to Apple and launch globally at Apple stores. So strong, strong strategy around digital. And then we talked a little bit about retail operations, but I just want to throw it back in again because this retail operations piece is something that we almost every time we see underappreciated and underinvested in. Make sure you're identifying someone that's going to run that retail operation. You've built the greatest thing ever. That retail operation is going to be extremely important to your success. Yes. We, uh we, it's, it's always how fast can we get an order? How fast can we get an order? I've got, I've got investors. I got my family. I need, uh, I need to get orders, without any idea of what you need to have for your back end. Have you got your distribution set up? Logistics. And by the way, who's looking to make sure that when you've got sell through, that somebody understands what sell through is and can read it? And by the way, who's out and who's forecasting? who's forecasting because you need eight to 10 weeks to get the supply over, another 60 days on the water, or else you're air freighting. Who is, the operations side is so critical. It's more critical to have that up and set right before you go out and start pounding down to get those orders on the table and ship dates. And so many times we've got to, we get them up, they're ready to go, we're, we got a CEO, 
we got to get that order, we got to get the revenue coming in, we got to get the revenue, we got to get the revenue, and we've got orders starting to come in and nobody has got that pull back in and we've got to go hit the reset button, we're going back. By the way, we're going to have to hold off shipments, we may miss that planogram because we have got to get this straight. And we uh, now are at a point where we don't pass, we have a pass fail. You're not going to retail, we're not going to get orders until you get through this program because that whole side, the execution side of operations is the critical part. I'll add one more thing too. For your manufacturer partners, it's really important that they understand it, right? They want to set up the line, they want to build the product, and they want to ship that product and move it out. And not aligning, not having a good retail operations person that can understand what's happening in manufacturing can really hurt you. It can also really help you because you can expedite and you can actually get product into store as you start to see sales growth. So having that retail operations tied with your manufacturing partner is really, really critical. So we're going to just talk a little bit uh, about a case study, and I think this is a name that everybody knows in the Valley. This is a client of ours, um, Nest, and one thing that, a couple things that they did really, really well. Uh, they sell to all the largest uh, retailers in the U.S. Uh, one of the retailers that was last to come on was Target. And they were really sure how does Target fit into Nest and why Target and, and how, could that, uh, how could that work. Nest had spent uh, a lot of time um, thinking about their product uh, before they came out. They developed a, a world-class product. Who has Nest here? There must be a lot of Nest people here, yeah. Um, but the other thing they thought about a lot was who's their customer. Right? So they, they really figured out the customer experience, really figured out how to make a great experience, and they did a lot of that direct. They were talking to customers direct, shipping products direct. And as they moved into retail, they took all that learning and started to build displays. And, and displays in retail were really critical for Nest because it's a very small box on the shelf, and actually they didn't spend a lot on their packaging, uh, but they've spent thousands of dollars. This is a display that's in Target and that's a $1,500 to $2,000 display. So from a capital requirement, this was part of their strategy, was to have that product displayed, and they knew they needed to be able to execute that. So they had done that at, at uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, and I think if you're, people have been in Lowe's, Nest has a huge display in Lowe's. But at Target, they had a different issue. They said, there's, the Target has mostly female shoppers. Are there, are there female guests there? So we did some work for them to kind of overlay uh, Nest database, the people that they knew they were selling, and Target's uh, consumer data on who their customers were. And there actually were a lot of females that were buying Nest across the country. So we, they designed a uh, specific display that spoke more to the female guest. They put it in test stores and really got great feedback. And it, kind of the point is, is that this retail partnership and how important that is, your customers are in retailers. You have to figure out how to talk to those customers and how to execute for their customers. So this program went from uh, Nest, right? Very big company, well capitalized. They started with 50 stores at Target to test this program out. Then it went to 200 and now it's in, I think it's in about 1,500 of Target stores across the country. But they spent a lot of money on analyzing what was happening. They had people go in stores and, and work side by side with Target. They did a lot of shopper interfaces. So they were learning what were people saying. So really, really encourage, and, and I know that here we're in the startup world and, and not all of you have capital or maybe nobody has capital like Nest has today. Um, but really, really important to get close to who that customer is and, and really work on what's that solution gonna be uh, at store. Another case study is we spoke a little bit about UbiTech, and I think we were excited to see a lot of companies here. What we didn't see was STEM toys. Maybe there was one STEM toy that we saw, but this is an emerging category that retail wants to see grow. Uh, especially in the U.S. market, there's uh, STEM and STEAM. Uh, there's a lot of push behind that in schools, and uh, people want these products to get in their kids. They want their kids to learn how to code, and that's going to be uh, you know, part of our future in the U.S. So retail's putting a lot of uh, emphasis behind that. Uh, Apple specifically 
uh, was interested in this category and uh, we helped this company think about how they were going to go to retail. A China-based company, um, so not a lot of resources that understood Western marketing, uh, Western positioning, kind of communication, but really, really good at building robotics. And so um, this product up on the top that you see is called, uh, called MeBot. And they were able to execute speed of retail from the initial meeting at Apple to a global launch, 460 stores in six months. So they were met at Apple in January, February, they were on shelf in July. And so part of what allowed them to win was yes, they had resources, but they had also done some thinking in terms of what type of organization they needed to partner with and, and put together to be in the US market. And they, they then have drove uh, throughout those stores events worldwide, uh, again, marketing the GMU brand and bringing that brand. And today, uh, after a short year, GMU is in Best Buy, Target, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Fry's, Fries. Amazon. Yeah. So if, you've, if you take the time and think about who your customer is and take the time and talk to the retailer as the retailer um, understands and, and likes to be talked to, you market your product, you can grow and have uh, really, really quick, quick success. And yes, they were, again, from when we met them to when we had them executed at all store levels worldwide at Apple, which included languages, packaging, instruction manuals, everything, eight months. And that was, they were paying attention to everything that we were bringing them into and allowing them to have access then to retailers so they could get quick decisions and quick things made. And uh, that was one of our fastest to market. It was very fun. So that's kind of the end of our uh, one piece. This is now going to tell us a little bit yeah. about what we're doing uh, all about retail and how we're going to help support hardware makers. So I don't know if any of you uh, ever shopped or have been to the Minnesota to the Mall of America. It's the largest uh, retail uh, store mall in the U.S. If you were to walk to, uh, if you were to walk to every single store inside the mall and not go in, it's three and a half miles. It has an entirely enclosed, roofed-in theme park. It's Nickelodeon Universe. And uh, they are one of the largest malls in expansion mode. They're actually going to increase their space another 50% from what they have today. And the leases are already signed with high-end stores. They have uh, two hotels that have been just moved up in tower, and they're adding an another one high-end. And so that, where everybody is saying retail is dead, but if you've made it a destination with lots of entertainment and, and uh, great food and restaurants, people will come and they want to be entertained and shop. They are, uh, they've opened up an office tower they've just built right over here. And we are going to be opening up a spring office at the Mall of America. And why is that important to, uh, for us to announce? Because for the startup community, it's going to be really a, an opportunity for you to come into Minneapolis. We're going to have a 25,000 square foot space. Where it, it's all around a retail accelerator. And it's a total immersion program that will bring you through. You can take pieces of it. You can go in and out. You can go shop because you think we're boring. Um, but it will have rooms where you'll be able to go in and planogram, which is kind of like laying out your product, so what it, what, what it look like at a Target store, and you can photograph it. So when they walk in, they understand where your positioning is. And we'll have. Uh, in that space, uh, an area for you to create video and all those other things. But what's important for you? It's going to be, and this is actually some of the look of what we've already got it designed and, and, uh, and it will be under, under construction. But what's important for you is that we are going to have a space down on the floor. The mall is looking for entertainment and excitement. And that's how you keep people coming and millennials who are shopping online, you have them coming in. They're bringing their kids, their family, and all that. And we're going to create, it's what is called Innovation Alley. And it will be a mini CES. It will be a permanent display down on the floor with we bringing in and out new startups. But it will allow them to come in, put their product down on the floor. It may be that I've got just 2D renderings. I may have a 
a 3D model and you can pitch your product and talk about it and get consumer feedback. Here's the numbers. 40 million people shop at the Mall of America each year. It is larger than um, uh, Disneyland and Disney World combined. 17 million of that are international visitors. And they're all coming in. Why? Because there's no sales tax on apparel in Minnesota. <laughs> and they're filling suitcases. But they're there for that experience. What we are using them for is consumer feedback for your products before you even go. The mall is asking us, we want it to be shown at, at the Mall of America first. Before you put it in the Best Buy up on the fourth floor, or the Brookstone store down on the second floor, or in the Nordstrom's. And so we'll have a real immersion program that will allow young companies with prototypes, whatever, to find out, is the consumer interested in this? Is the price point right? We can test it. Maybe we started out at $500 and it ends up at the right price point that everybody kind of gets it and goes, yeah, I'd buy that, is 300 So those are the things that we're uh, excited about. And yeah. And why Minneapolis? Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, there's lots of uh, incubation, engineering, ID firms out here. There's lots of capital out here. But there's very few voices that talk about retail and, and consumer and how to sell your products. And so Minneapolis not only is headquarters for Mall of America, but we're also headquarters for Best Buy, headquarters for Target. So we believe in that community we have the largest mentor base of retail uh, experts that are looking to help you uh, be successful with building your brands. So thank you very much. Thanks we very appreciate much, the everyone. time. Thank you yeah. to Hardware Con, Hardware Massive.